Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Ready Day from the Stony Brook MFA program. I'm Scott McKenzie, and tonight we have the pleasure of hearing from and talking with Karen Bender, who is with us this semester as a visiting writer. In fact, I have the pleasure of uh, learning from Karen this semester in a class about creating strangeness in stories. So, um, Karen. Uh, is the author of two story collections, Refund, a finalist for the National Book Award in Fiction, a uh, shortlist selection for the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Prize, a uh, longlist selection for the Story Prize, and a lot Los Angeles Times bestseller, and the New Order, a longlist selection for the Story Prize. Um, a new collection, The Words of Dr. L and other stories is forthcoming from Counterpoint Press. She is also the author of two novels like Normal People and A Town of Empty Rooms. Her fiction has appeared in many, many magazines and she has won three Pushcart Prizes. She has won grants from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Rona Jaffe Foundation. And she is currently core faculty at the MFA program at Alma College. So please welcome Karen Bender. Oh, thank you, Scott. Um, so I'm really honored to be um, to be reading tonight and also teaching this class on um, at Stony Brook on um, strangeness and stories. And you know, kind of strangeness or absurdity or, or juxtaposition is something that's some that I, I really um, it's really important to me in my own writing. Um, it's kind of the straight, you know, the ways you see the world in ways that are the ways we are not told to see it the way that, that we see it. And, um, one thing that also I do in my work is try and grapple with, um, what's going on in the world, you know, personal responses to what, to, um, external things. And just before I read my own work, I'm, I've just been just looking at what's happening in Ukraine and just, the horror of everything there. And I wanted to read a little tiny poem um, by Ukrainian Pope before I read my work, um, just to acknowledge what's going on there. Um, I've been following Ilya Kaminsky, who's Ukrainian American poet um, on Twitter. And he posted this beautiful poem by Katerina Kalitko. Um, I'm just gonna read it, so it's four lines. It says, life is a house on the side of the road old world style, like our peasant house divided into two parts. In one, they wash the dead man's body and weep. In the other, they dress a bride. It's just, I, which I feel like is such a incredible poem because it looks at all the kind of horror and grief and beauty kind of juxtaposed against each other and kind of how that, how that is the world and, and, you know, just kind of wrestling with the horror going on there and the violence. And, you know, I was just out shopping today and things seemed so calm here. And just kind of how I, I, as a writer, I don't have answers on how to sort of deal with that, but that it's something, I think the art resides in that space between the horror and beauty. Um, and at artists, that's one thing that we can, can explore and look at. Um, and so, so I wanted, so just in terms of my work, I, uh, I deal with a lot of violence in um, my collection, The New Order. It's, um, it was written kind of between 2015 and 2000, 2014, 2017. And it was kind of to, trying to address a lot of what was going on in terms of, uh, you know, different sorts of violence and bigotry and, um, you know, otherness and different things going on um, in the country. And the new order um, is a title story of the collection. Um, and it was it's trying to look at um, an individual response um, within an intermediate school orchestra in a junior high school in the 1970s and a, a shooting that happens uh, in the school. So I'm gonna read a few pages of the new order. I'll just take off my glasses because I can read it more easily. Um, we were friends or we knew each other and both of us had been in the other room when the attack occurred. This is in the 1970s when these events didn't happen at schools. A teacher and ninth grader were shot in the cafeteria and another teacher was injured. So that from then on, 
Her arm hung down like a broken wing. The girl who was killed was a member of the cello section and she was named Sandra. We're all part of the intermediate orchestra of our junior high school. And she had been in the cafeteria where we were also supposed to be 10 minutes after she left the multi-purpose room. The cafeteria was serving fish and chips and Sandra left early because she wanted to be first in line. The man went to the table and shot two teachers and also her, one, two, three, everyone looking on in disbelief. The man had been one of the fathers at the school. As part of the process to get us past the incident, which was what they called the attack, after the assemblies and the short and not fruitful discussions in homeroom telling us to report any suspicious behavior to the vice principal, our orchestra teacher, Mr. Handelman, decided to proceed as usual. In two weeks, we were supposed to audition for our chairs in the orchestra. We would each play for one minute and the teacher would rank us on tone, musicality and pitch and arrange us in a new order. Lori and I had become strangely better friends after the incident. We didn't know Sandra very well. Mostly we knew her as a good cellist. She had a deep tone that you could hear in your stomach when she played and this made the air feel like velvet. She usually occupied seat three. Lori was seat two. She'd always been seat two. Seat one went to John Schubert, who was adept at pieces that required rapid finger work, whose thumbs slid buttery up the strings and who was always in a way that seemed almost supernatural on key, but whose tone was sometimes thin as a revealing some deep unsolved craving within him. We all regarded each other with sharp, interested eyes. The new order was especially important because the first cello would perform a short one minute solo as part of a fall festival performance for the school. In the center of my heart, I wanted to be seat one someday. I practiced a lot. I was going to audition with my favorite piece, The Dying Swan, which felt perhaps problematic, but it was what I was best at playing. And I loved how I felt when I played it. My chest pressing against the wood of the cello, the sense that I was inside the music, which felt like the heart of everything. And at that age, I wanted to crouch inside the heart of the world. I tried not to think about Sandra or the teachers when we sat in the cafeteria. We had not been allowed in it for a week as the school administration scrubbed any evidence of the incident from the room. But unfortunately, there was nowhere else to feed us, so they let us back in. The room was now clean in a stringent, terrifying way, as though it represented all the thoughts we were not supposed to have about our futures. There were rumors about the incident. Everyone wanted to have a theory. Sandra had been wearing a tube top and the murderer's father instructed his daughter, a ninth grader named Jen, not to wear tube tops. He was rumored to find them immodest and harmful in some way no one could explain. Or he shot at Mrs. Simon, an algebra teacher who had recently turned him down for a date and Sandra unfortunately just got in the way. There was no clarity on anything as though there could be, but the cloudiness of the incident made everyone eager to contribute to the memorial, the school now set up in a corner, a peculiar display with a few bouquets of flowers, some posters with large hearts drawn on them. Everyone was eager to show a capacity for love. We talked about the other members of the orchestra with an intense desire to categorize them, sort them in ways that were flattering and not. Lori assumed a new mantle of authority following the attack, a new hardness that made it seem she wanted to press herself like a bug into amber into the air. I looked at Lori and I wanted to fold myself into her, which was an impulse that alarmed me. I didn't know why I thought I would be safe in her. I wanted her or someone in the world to locate me. I wanted this so much I was dizzy. We glanced at the teachers, the other students, wondering who might kill us. It could be anybody, apparently, and it was unclear what could be the armor to stop it. In this realm of anxiety, we briskly, authoritatively ranked the others. We agreed that John was overrated in his playing, but had a beautiful way of spinning the cello when he was bored, his long legs stretched out, 
and the Tracy L in the flute section was a bad player because her high notes never quite hit the right way. Lori called her mother a loser, her parents divorced, mother always out, or mother's girlfriends coming over and all of them drinking vodka shots in the car. My parents were always home, but moved as if the air were made of jello, and they believed the world was always about to break. We sat in that gleaming, scrubbed cafeteria and ate our sugary hamburgers. The world was trembling around us, and it seemed it was going to eat us. We had not talked about the incident. We had not talked about everything we did each day to our classmates in our minds, for the boundary between the violence outside and inside our minds seemed thin and permeable. Routinely, I'd be murdering an unbearable violinist who gave me cold, diminishing looks, or pressing myself naked against the first clarinetist who had delicate, beautiful arms I wanted to wrap around me. I wanted so much always. The world was spangled and nothing felt quite real. Lori talked on and on about the mundane, about the quirky shoes she desired and the way she glared at the boy who once spit at her when she didn't say hi back, and the way the square of chocolate cake the cafeteria served today tasted like metal, which seemed unfortunate and wrong. I wanted her to help me so fiercely my skin burned. I wanted someone to help me. Now we sat in that cafeteria, our lunches set out, on the table, the hamburger and frozen fries and pudding separated into their little compartments. We pretended we were merely eating, that we were safe. We both wanted to be first cello, to perform that solo, to play for a moment in a circle of brightness. We discussed the upcoming auditions for our new chairs carefully, not sharing what music we would audition with. Lori seemed particularly nervous, which was curious to me, for she was a good player her tone better than anyone's. She stretched and said, I'm so bad, I'm going to fuck up. A groan that was a lie because she was better than I was, talented in an ineffable, natural way. And I understood my role was to say, no, you're not going to, which felt like opening my mind too wide. And I was filled with a chilly, unruly fear. But this was the true thing. We both wanted to be first chair and perform that solo. We were both shouldering darkness in that hot, dirty cafeteria, but what we wanted was a moment in the light, the auditorium filled with people listening to us play the music of composers who created those sounds 200 years ago. We sat in the cafeteria, the other kids shouting to each other across the room, screaming. We wanted to taste, to taste those hamburgers forever. We wanted to live. We had two weeks to practice. The entire orchestra was practicing. I walked by little practice rooms and heard the muffled sounds of violins, cellos, oboes, flutes, the intense sounds of students. Inside these rooms, everyone sounded angelic and furious. I imagined the students had lost their voices and could only speak through their instruments like this. I walked by a room and heard Lori practicing and stood, my heart lacy with panic by her door. In those days after the incident, we were different. We were all afraid. Eyeing our lunch, we eyed each other like vultures. We were flying over the world, hovering, ready to dive in and grab what we needed. We were talking about our pieces and what we would play. And Lori's arm stretched out on the chair beside her and she was describing, I don't know what, the fact that her bow didn't take resin well, or that again, she thought she would fail during her solo, saying this again, when we both knew it wasn't true. It felt false in an elaborate manufactured way, made in a factory of lies, and this made me furious. I was furious at the way the school had not told us exactly why the father had gone on his rampage. I was furious at the lame directions they gave us to hit the ground if someone did this. I was furious at the way, furious at the way my parents at the school told us not to worry. I was furious when Lori claimed she would perform badly when she knew music so naturally and fully she would not. There was a flash of violence outside of me and within me, a massive truck driving over and through my skin. You won't win, I said. It just came out. There was no reason to say it, I just did. I paused. Then I continued, no one thinks you'll win. She stared at me. 
She lifted a trembling hand to brush her hair off her face. Why not? She asked softly. People just say, lots of people, no way. This was getting worse by the moment. I looked away. I felt a pressure in my throat, the capacity to say more and more. What people? Many. I can't say. Oops. This seemed the worst thing, the manufacture of others demeaning her. But I stood by this. I didn't know how to stop. Well, she said, she was unable to look at me. I felt powerful for the first time since the incident, as though I had become a steel spike, completely hard and sharp. But I also trembled for I simultaneously felt a plunging sense of loss. It was confusing to experience both of these at once. I realized then how much I admired my friend, even loved her, and that I had damaged something I could not see. Lori didn't stand up and walk away. She changed the subject to the staleness of a carrot cake of the carrot cake on our plates, but it felt as though something finished between us and that we were now unknowable to one another, separate, an ostrich and a bear. I'm gonna stop there. So um, thank you for listening. Um, Frank, no, uh, Scott. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. That was great. I have so many questions, but uh, before, <laughs> before I uh, dive into those, I just wanna give a reminder to everyone who's listening. If you have, uh, just throw them in the chat and then I'll be checking the chat. And, uh, and then that's the way we can uh, get questions for Karen. So that being said, um, so let's start with the, the, the broad question of how this, how this story came about. Was it you know, inspired by something? Um, you just pull it out of the, out of the ether? <laughs> how, how did this one come about? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, stories come in mysterious ways. Um, this one, I tracked to a couple different things that I that kind of grabbed hold of me and I, I couldn't let go of. One was, I uh, I remember I, we, uh, we were um, having dinner with this friend of ours who's had told us a story of um, an old friend he had who he hadn't seen in years from, I think it was from high school or college, and he came and stayed with him. Uh, for a weekend, and he just kept talking and talking, and and then he realized um, the friend was in love with him, um, and that was interesting. It was like something he hadn't realized, um, and it, it was you know just a, this sort of connection that happened. Um, and I so there was that I, I I was interested in that, and then also there was this Alice Monroe story called Fiction. I'm going to write it in the chat. Alice Monroe called Fiction. And it's this um, amazing story um, about this woman whose husband leaves her um, for, a, he has an affair and she's devastated by it. And then the daughter of the woman he has the affair with writes a book and comes and talks, does a reading at um, this bookstore in here. She goes to the reading and she doesn't know how the, the um, daughter will uh, perceive her. And actually she realized that the daughter perceives her in this, in this way that's really positive. And she actually had been full of all this rage toward the parent. And so there's this kind of misperception or misunderstanding that's really oddly nourishing to her. And I just thought that was a great twist in the story. And I wanted to, and that's why I have um, Lori come back at the end and the, the sort of mean thing um, that the narrator says to her early on has a different, she has a different response to it mm -hmm. in her life. So I just thought that was really interesting how different people perceive things and take them different ways. And how people come from the past, you know, and, and come and, you know, and connect in different ways. So I thought that was really good. Yeah. And it's interesting. They, and they come to get, come together, um, in their in their sixties, like there's some great distance from from this right. incident, right? Um, which um, you know, memory can play a big role. But you know, yeah, I thought it was really interesting that like um, Lori seems to have some clarity about what happened, yeah. but maybe the narrator doesn't. Yeah, yeah. And then bring up this misunderstanding. Like you have two very different perceptions of mm -hmm. of an event. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, 
Uh, uh, which um, kind of leads to my next question is, um, so since, while it's not the main, I wouldn't say the main theme of, of the story, but a certain, uh, certainly a driver is the, uh, is the violence that occurred. Um, right. And it's certain, uh, certainly a time theme, yet you said it in the, in the seventies. Right. Yeah. And I was wondering what your thinking was around that. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I think I, I mean, I've definitely written about school shootings before in my, in my collection refund, I have a story called reunion that, that has actually a school shooting at a, actually at a high school reunion and, um, or it's a not, it's a school, it's a shooting at a reunion. So it's not a school shooting, but and then there's another story called the sea turtle hospital that also is. So it's something that is just, you know, it's, it's in our, it's in our culture. It's in our world that we're dealing with it all the time. And so, um, I, it was just something that felt like it would, I just kind of rose up in the story. Um, I, I said it in the seventies, cause that's when I was in junior high school and it felt, um, you know, it's a time that I, you know, I'm connected to and, you know, there were strange, you know, things that happened then too, different violent things, but they were more shocking. You know, we're not, we weren't numb to them the way it feels like, you know, in some ways it's, you know, so common now. So, yeah. Um, so I have, Another question about that, but I want to give people in the chat a chance. So uh, Susan Merrill writes, Aww. I love the juxtaposition of the absolutely personal and the wider horror. Mm -hmm. I wonder how carefully you think about that juxtaposition of sentence and, and sentence and letting this drama play out. The, uh, how carefully you think of in, in the sentence? Wait, quite uh, think about the just juxtaposition of sentence. Oh, the personal um, and the wider horror, right? Yeah. Oh, I'm about the juxtaposition of sentence, sentence, and sentence. <laughs> um, well, I guess how do I careful? How careful do I think about juxtaposition? Um, I just I feel like I just I feel like we live juxtaposition every day, you know, in so many ways, and that is just part of being a person, you know. Um, and I just, you know. I, I think it's just something that I I just process in in my life and I try and think about I you know because I you know one thing I think about is you know we think about you know grief and you know love and in terms of personal interactions and they also relate to larger issues too um, you know when Trump was elected, I'll say I felt grief for my country. You know, I felt yeah. this, I mean, and that was kind of surprising, I mean, in a way to me. So, um, so I think it's just something that's in us, in our worlds, you know, in our, as, as yeah. we go day, day, day by day, we, you know, if we're really alert to things, I think we become more alert to the juxtaposition. Yeah. And it, I guess a juxtaposition, I, I might, take a stab at here if you will is that yeah. so we have um a violent event which yeah. one might call a, which is very disordering yeah and we have all right. this um people trying to make sense you know um you know this proceeding as usual you know trying to go back to normal um you use new order a couple of times but you know also like you know the students are trying to categorize and sort each other out Mm -hmm. um ranking right. each other even the even the food is like what is it separated into their little compartments so right. Um, right. is that something you're playing with is that well it's interesting i mean i think eudora welty has a really great uh, observation wherever you go you meet part of your story which i think is true and i think when you're writing you just are like um, i feel like you're like lint you're like a lint collector like everything relates in some way to your subconscious and so I think that's how your observations, your sentences, you know, everything will relate to the story. I think your subconscious, your awareness starts collecting everything that relates to what you're feeling and working out in the story. Yeah, and um, I got some clarification from <laughs> about the order of the sentence order, which I'm, I'm wondering if I was catching what she was like in the opening paragraph, it's you know, it's not like this happened, then this happened. It's, oh, it seems to be like the, right. the narrator seems to be grabbing, not mm -hmm. grab, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, um, like it's a little more associative. Yeah, and this yeah. was so 
Oh, so interesting. That's no, point. that's interesting. Yeah. No, I think, um, yeah, that's a really, that's a good observation. I, I do think um, we live in a culture that's very, well, I know personally it feels very ADD, <laughs> you know, like where you just feel like you're, you know, you're in, you're thinking about one thing and then you have some external, you know, thing going on. And then, you know, there, there's so much, it feels very fragmented. And I feel like that is something maybe I want to convey in, in, um, in the story, in the narrative. Yeah. Cause we kind of get the story of a teenager, but through the eyes of a, of a, of a grown, of grown woman. Right. Um, right. 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 It's retrospective first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so another question here from uh, from un, 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 unknown zero. <laughs> How are you figuring? <laughs> Great name, um, mysterious. How are you figuring this measure of numbness in these modern a- adolescents in terms of how how it may leak into the nature of how they perceive violence in adulthood? Oh, that's interesting. God, what a great question. I mean, I'm not a sociologist, so I can't say. Um, but I think, um, I mean, actually, I, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that the kids in the schools are numb to it. I, I feel like our, you know, I, I think I think kids are deeply affected by um by the violence that's going on um in the most horrible, you know, and and visceral ways. Um you know, and the parents too, you know, I mean, I've had calls where, you know, you get the alarm on your phone and, you know, I'm, and, you know, I remember once I was standing outside our kids grade school and there was like, it was on lockdown and we didn't know what was going on, you know, it, and it, it just, I, I don't think that we're, I, I, in a way, I don't think that we're, we're numb to it. Actually, it's probably not the right word to say, but that, you know, it feels like, maybe we would have been more shocked by all these things when they first started happening. Um, You know, I was just actually reading um, uh, Joanne Beard's essay, um, The Fourth State of Matter, which is an incredible essay about uh, this mass shooting in Iowa City, um, which where a student um, shot the physics department and murdered uh, several people. And it's just a great essay that looks at, um, you know, kind of the way that shocked the community. Um, and it, I think these are shocking things that are happening now. Um, but the fact they're so common and they haven't stopped is just, it's just hard to, it's how do we process it? It's, it's like a constant assault. Yeah. And we almost need to be dissociated from it. We need, um, I, I think people are becoming uh, dissociated. And it's interesting, how do they perceive violence in adulthood? It's it's a good question. I mean, um, is there a way that we're, you know, I mean, I mean, you look at, I mean, one thing that I find shocking too is the number of, you know, the COVID deaths, we're, all, we're, we're veering mm-hmm. in on a million. And, and there was a, um, someone commented, you know, with 100,000 deaths, the New York Times did this front page thing with all the names of people that died. And at 900,000, they didn't mark that in it, you know, so how do we process these things that keep going on and are, are, are difficult and horrible, you know, um, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I, I feel like as writers or artists, one thing is, we can do is just kind of keep addressing it in the personal um, psychological responses to them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And speaking of personal, you, you write a, a narrator in the, in the first person we get to see, she yeah. might not know what's going know what's going on in her head, but we, I mean, I think we get a really good look and it does make it personal. It does make it personal. Like, uh, yeah. is that something, how did you go about deciding how to, you know, point of view, yeah. how, how close? Well, how you, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. It's hard for me to say why I choose like third person or, or first, or I've done, a, I recently did a story in we, which was fun. Um, I, I think it just sort of, it just kind of what feels like it will get the narrative going. Um, I really liked this narrator. I just, I found her interesting and I, I felt like I wanted to, to get a point of view that was, you know, both older and that it was looking back on a, on a, a young woman 
and also looking at the kind of a scope of a friendship over years, which is also interesting, you know, like as I get older, just seeing, you know, friendships that, you know, you see people that are, you've been friends with for many years, or you see people that come in, you know, to your life that you didn't see for years. It's just so powerful and, and moving often. So I think that was one reason I want to do that kind of retrospective first. Yeah. Um, got another question out of the chat. It <laughs> um, was from from uh, Gianno Cromley, um, yeah. how important, <laughs> great, um, how important in this story is the fact that the students didn't know oh. why the shooting mm -hmm. happened. It seems incredibly important, mm -hmm. but I wonder what your thinking was on that. So um, how, you know. Oh, interesting. Well, I think it's probably how kids are given information on events. They're often not told why they happened. And I think, you know, um, maybe they found out later, actually, it's an interesting point. <laughs> you know, did they find out later? And, and you know, I didn't actually think about that. So I, I think, um, but I think what I want to talk about there is how kids are not given the full information. And that actually leads to her anger. You know, she talks about, you know, she feels this, you know, anger growing in her about, you know, you know the way the adults are treating it. And then she's mean to her friend. Yeah, so it almost seems like the people around her or the the adults were not <laughs> getting in line or being yeah. you know, ordering in a way that made made sense to her. Yeah, um, yeah. And so, uh, kind of uh, circling back to this idea of violence, um, I, and I think this piece plays a lot of many different kinds of. You know, we have obviously the. Yeah. Uh, but then we have the way that, you know, friends can be violent to each other and, and maybe more subversive or so is that, you know, can you talk about how that was working throughout the piece in your, throughout the creation, editing and such? Um, so, so, so I think what I want to do is look at, you know, a personal um, feeling, you know, how do people respond to kind of bad events going on around them and how do they process that in their own kind of weird ways? You know, it's like the cycle, how does a psychological respond to the external event? And I think, um, I think, you know, characters, I think what's interesting in characters is how they're, is when they're not, um, is when they're not noble. You know, I think characters are most interesting when they're kind of messy. And so I think, what I thought I wanted to do with, with the narrator is show how she, um, you know, you know, it kind of wasn't able to kind of express how she felt. And so instead she, she kind of lashed out at her friend. Yeah. Um, I think uh, in, in the chat, Paul Harding uh, talks about uh, the sort of dismaying experience. Um, you know, this is this inability to, to, you know, grapple with, with this sort of thing. Right. Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah. The constant, com the constant conversation and the stale carrot cake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the stale carrot cake was, yeah, definitely deliberate um, placed next to each other. Reproduce it. Yes. Yeah. I think that that is actually what I was trying to do. Right. Well, you know, this is, this is, um, you know, I, and I could, <laughs> I, maybe I'll bother you with some more questions in, in class later. Um, but, um, you know, I think, um, yeah, again, you know, thank you, you know, thank you for, for reading your piece, for coming out and, and oh. sharing with us tonight. Um, and, uh, Unless there is something I or someone else missed that uh, that the reader needs to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, I think, um, you know, I guess my thought is, you know, just in terms of um, as writing students, you know, just um, just feeling that you can um, write about big issues um, that you, you know, shouldn't be afraid to kind of tackle. Um, things that are complicated and hard, you know, that um, that's, that's kind of why we're here. And as artists, we, uh, we have a role where we can, um, I think it was Toni Morrison said something that like fiction can be like a warning, you know, that by showing how people 
you know, different, you know, by showing events, how people react, you know, to different, you know, kind of awful events, you know, it's like a, a warning, which I think is really a great role for fiction. You know, um, we can learn from it. Yeah. And I guess that's, that is our job as, as artists yeah. is to ask yeah. the hard questions to yeah. shine the light in the dark corners or hold magnifying glasses up to things. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And it's, uh, um, you know, I, you know, there's, there is one other thing that I, that actually yeah. I remembered about this was that I don't want to give anything away, but there I would there seems to be a, a sense of a lack of resolution, and um, yeah, and you know it does it does make sense even in modern context like a lot of these acts there's no there's no way to compartmentalize it to tie it up you know nice in a in a bow like mm-hmm. you know, so many unanswered questions and you know is that sort of wondering how you played with that. Yeah. Um, not wrapping this up neatly in the end. Right. I mean, so we, yeah. So that's something I think is about, you know, just uh, writing that I really respond to is writing that, that leaves us kind of balanced in this point of like hope and despair, you know, it leaves us open kind of place for the reader to kind of participate and figure out, you know, kind of, you know, kind of how they think the, the right, the character will, will kind of exist and, and figure out their life. We were talking about this with that Miranda July story. Um, so let's see, something comes from, something comes from nothing we were talking about in class, you know, where there's this end in this story. Um, and uh, uh, this character is, is deciding whether she's going to leave her job at a peep show and she's counting and we don't know, like she's like she's counting it, then we don't know if she's going to leave or not. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it just balances in this way; it leaves it open ended, and and to not tie things up, I think, is really um, important for a story because I think it le- helps a reader participate. And they think, well, you know, at the very end, she's listening to the this sound of the cello, and I think, you know, with the sound that she, you know, what does it mean to her to listen to that sound? And the reader can kind of interpret that however they want. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you. Oh, so thank much. you so much. Great question. Yeah. And thank yeah. you. Thank you everyone uh, who joined us tonight. Thank you for tuning in and we will see you next time. Thank you so much. Yay, thanks. Bye.